Welcome to another Dragonland Saga review episode. It is Kirinor Brook Green the 29th. My name is Adam, and today I'm going to give you my spoiler review of City of the Lost by Mary H. Herbert. Now, I will be spoiling this story, so if you don't want to know the details, don't watch. Go read it, come back, and we'll get into it then. I would like to take a moment and invite you to consider becoming a member of this channel if you're not already. There's links in the description below, and you can always pick up Dragonlance Gaming materials by uh, using the affiliate links also in the description below. Um, this is my perspective only, so if yours differs, that's okay. We don't have to agree. We are not a monolith here. However, I would like to know why and how and in what ways. So if you're joining us live, welcome. Leave a note in the chat right there, and if you're watching this after the fact, then leave something in the comments. And... Uh, we can always interact there as well. It'll be fun. All right, so the way these things work, if you're new to this for some reason, is that uh, I'm going to give you my pre-written review, and then we'll just sort of discuss and riff after that. Pretty straightforward. It's live, so it's very, uh, I don't know, arguably unhinged. <laughs> it's very free-flowing and free-form here. So I have this hair. Someone planted a hair on my face. All right, so as you can see, I'm clearly riffing here all right jason thanks for joining live chris how you doing uh audiobooks all right wonder how legal that is <laughs> but thanks for tuning in live regardless okay let's get into this the novel started out similar to the clandestine circle though it does a good job using what happened in that novel to contextualize lynch and Magier. she was charged spent weeks in prison, then the charges were dropped after Lord Bite sent word to the knights. I'm very glad to have read that novel before starting this one. Lynch is working out of a section of an ancient ruined Sylvanesty ghost city called Gal Tracalas. This city reminds me of Nandor's homeland of Al Kolnidar, from what we do in the shadows. Now I'm listening, and I can't, every time I hear them say the name, city name, I think of Nandor from what we do in the shadows. And that's not a bad thing, but it does take me out of Dragonlance pretty severely. I'm listening to the audiobook of this, so I'm unsure of the spelling of any of these words, and even the pronunciation of some of them are wildly off, as the narrator is saying a lot of locations and names even more strangely than I do. The Knights of Salamnia operate out of a portion of that city that they rebuilt called Mirage. Linsa, Linsha is summoned by the dragon lord Aesta, a brass dragon that reigns in this area, contested by the blue dragon lord Thunder. Now these are not overlords, they're lesser dragon overlords. Aesta wants Linsha to accompany her to Thunder in order to get the feel of the dragon's reaction upon uh, questioning about these triplet brass dragons that are missing. Um, they act as guards for Aesta, and she suspects Thunder killed them. Upon questioning the blue dragon lord, they conclude that he was in fact lying when he feigned ignorance, saying that he would kill them if they ever entered his territory. They also noted a small army massing in Thunder's realm composed of humans and tarmac, though no one seems to know what tarmac are, which is very strange since you know, the Chaos Wars saw them used by the Dark Knights. Aesta returned to the city when Lynchia, uh, with Lynchia and changed into a human form to show Lynchia a brood of gold dragon eggs that she's watching and asked Lynchia to swear on her honor to protect them. This is a bit of foreshadowing here because there's no reason for us as a reader to believe that Aesta has any real danger in front of her. Her and Thunder have been ruling sections of this area of the Plains of Dust for quite some time. So why would she suddenly need someone to watch the Brass Dragon Eggs? We're about to find out. Lynchia did agree, though. She then is dismissed to report the massing army that they noticed with Thunder to her Legion of Steel contact, Lanther, and her Knight of Salamnia Circle that is within the City of Mirage. The second in command of that Knight of Salamnia Circle, Sir Remick, hates Lynchia, and her knights of um, for her or unorthodox behavior. Excuse me. The first in command, Lord Morick, takes her with him and other Salamnic knights to the citadel and are ambushed in rout. Now the citadel is basically like the Salamnic knights' fortress in this area. 
A massive lightning storm destroys much of the city and area, obviously from thunder, and the mysterious attackers are obviously the Dark Knights and Tarmac. Before Lynchia loses consciousness in the battle, her dagger was taken from her and buried in Lord Morrick's back. So when Sir Remick and the other Islamic Knights arrive, they immediately blame Lynchia for the murder. You know, as assholes would do. This is completely illogical and is something not even Derek Crownguard would do in my opinion. Lyncha is protected by a centaur named Leonidas, who she favored earlier in the novel, and she's taken into custody to be tried for Lord Merrick's death, or Lord Morrick's death. This is so insane, I can't even imagine a universe where this would ever happen. The entire Salamic Knight troop unit is moving to the Citadel, gets ambushed by unknown assassins, everyone dies except for Lyncha Majir, and the only conclusion they can come to is that Lynchia killed the entire troop of knights? And that carries through throughout the entire novel. It's really aggravating to read. It, it makes zero logical sense. And even later on, I'm going to cover it here in just a second, when they feign this mock trial to literally kill her, they have no proof, no evidence, no facts, just a hunch. And the Slamet Knights are okay with executing a Rose Knight in good standing on that hunch. <laughs> Why does every author write Knights of Slamnia like absolute morons? Why can't there just be a, a logical Knight of Slamnia? I, I just don't understand why they have to continually... This is in an era where the, the measure has been rewritten by Lord Gunther Uth Wistan. The, the whole blind arrogance of the Knights of Salamnia is supposed to have been gone the way of the dodo. You know, it's supposed to have been overwritten with this new measure. So why are they all still acting like total morons? I don't know. It drives me insane. Her giant owl Varia, Lynch's giant owl Varia, when trying to locate Lynchia, because now she is, of course, um, taken into custody, sees a large number of ships approaching from the east in the ocean, and when the army, with the army to the west, it seems like Thunder has Iesta right where he wants her, with war on the horizon, surrounded on both sides. Naturally, the Islamic Knights are acting like blind idiots. This trope truly bothers me, as I never saw the knighthood this idiotic after the Crown Guard fiasco. I suppose stupid is as stupid does, right? Varia begins searching for Lynchia initially, then Iesta, and as she is unable to find either of them, she approaches the legionnaire Lanther that Lynchia talks with a lot, telling him about the coming warships. Then, not knowing what to do, but sure there's trouble on the horizon, she flies to Sanction to ask Lord Bite if Crucible can come and help Lynchia. Lanther seems to report the information to the Knights of Salamnia, and Lynchia is tried and found guilty of murder of the Knight Commander without any evidence or defense on her behalf. I can't tell if Sir Remick is corrupted or just single-minded and blind. And that's never answered. Like, he just is this way. He, is in, he hates her passionately for some reason. No other Knights are willing to step up on her behalf vocally, and... They're just like, yeah, we're going to kill her because she sucks. Okay, honorable knight, that's a great plan. <laughs> it really bothers me. Before she can be executed, Sir Hugh, a friend of Lynch's, helps her escape the dungeon. Lynch immediately goes to Iesta's lair searching for her, as no one has seen the Dragon Lord, and many assume that the Dragon Lord has abandoned her territory. Lynch goes into her lair and discovers her body, and her, miss her body has a missing head. The dragon lords and overlords use the heads to make skull totems, knowing that a massive naval force and the land army that Thunder already has, and operating off of the assumption that Thunder is behind both the storm and the devastated Gal Tracolos and Mirage, Lynch seeks out the Legion of Steel leadership. She was accompanied by the city militia on discovery of the corpse of Iesta, so she now has to inform the Legion about Iesta and the ships. It turns out that they already knew from Varia and Thunder's army then strikes. 
It only takes hours before the majority of Galtracolos falls, and then Thunder turns her site or his site to the Salamnic Knight Citadel and raises it to the ground, killing the entire circle that we're aware of thus far. Devastated, Lynchia and the Legionnaires flee to their area in the city, and the invading army of Tarmac Brutes provides a respite in the heat of the day. Lynchia is offered membership into the Legion, but politely refuses, and decides to go to rest. She sleeps and has this weird dream about a Dark Knight traitor from the last novel that she fell in love with, telling her not to trust the man. She doesn't understand the omen, but we readers immediately are presented with her old friend Lanther, who asks her about the secret dragon eggs that Aiesta was hiding. It turns out that Thunder knows about the dragon eggs and wants them for himself. Lynchia feigns ignorance about them, but it seems that Lanthorn knows better, and as she stalks off to fight the invading army, he smiles to himself, assuming that she will lead them to the eggs. At least, that's my assumption thus far. As Lynchia regroups with the militia and bodyguards, she's intent upon finding the eggs, but hears Varia calling out to her, like, telepathically. She leaves the area that she's in, and she finds Varia, who tells her that Crucible has come to her aid. Crucible demands to see Aiesta's re uh, remains, and of course the eggs. They enter the secret area below the palace, and find the guardian of the eggs dead as well, just like Aiesta, without a head or signs of any dragon battle. They return to the surface to be met with the remaining legionnaires, guards, militia, and surprisingly, some Salamnic Knights from the Citadel. It turns out a handful made it out of the hidden tunnel before the Citadel was destroyed, including our favorite douchebag of all, Sir Remick. Now, he attempts to reclaim Lynchia as a prisoner, but everyone refuses to let him do it, and Crucible, the dragon, then grabs him and throws him across the room. Just then, the Brutes begin their assault anew and completely retake the city, forcing its defenders out and captures and enslaves anyone that couldn't make it out. Thunder is moving his totem into the palace, and having claimed the bronze dragon eggs, adds them to his totem as well. The Tarmac General wants to claim the city for his own and destroy the remaining militia, but Thunder couldn't care less, and the General knows that as soon, Thunder is going to no longer need them, and who knows what's going to happen at that point. They, however, want to keep this city, as they see it as they won it in battle. So Lynchia decides to try and retake the eggs. She sneaks into the palace only to be captured by the Tarmac. The Tarmac General reveals that he killed the dragons for thunder with an abyssal lance that he got from Arikin from the Chaos War, and then leaves Lynchia tied up with the lance only to be rescued and the lance is taken with them. This is clearly a ploy by the Tarmac to have Lynchia and the militants kill thunder for them. As Lynchia and Crucible plan on doing just that, she mounts the stolen abyssal lance on him and they fly to draw thunder into Aiesta's treasure room and beyond to kill him. Once in the skull totem room, they take an egg from it in order to draw uh, thunder deeper into uh, Aiesta's labyrinth, and when they're doing this, the Tarmac enter the palace and destroy the totem, reclaim the eggs, and murder all of the militant mercenaries that they hired to take the city. After a heavy battle, thunder is killed with the lance and Lynchia carries Crucible out in the form of a cat. They meet up with the militants and flee the overrun city. They realize that they were used by the Tarmac and that they have the Tarmac have the eggs, but everyone is too beaten down to continue at the moment, and the novel ends. I skipped over a lot of the events in this novel, and I believe it ultimately was a good story, but as I was listening to it rather than reading it, I feel like I didn't absorb it as well. Unfortunately, this whole trilogy is an audiobook book for me, so I'm going to have to f try to focus even harder on this second book. I really do appreciate how Mary Herbert, the author, focuses on each order and its members and calls back to the clandestine circle for added context. I'm looking forward to seeing where the story leads in the tarmac. They're as brutal as they've ever been, which I do appreciate. I do not hold out hope for the Legionnaires or the Salamnics in retrieving the eggs. If you've enjoyed uh, Dragonlance Fifth Age stories or Lynchia Magir, you're probably going to love this book. Otherwise, I'm not sure I would call it a must-read. It's even more hyper-specific to the Fifth Age than the and the Dragon Lords than the Clandestine Circle was, and it's not even a genre book like that one was, which made it so wonderful. So, you know, kind of leave it up to you as an audience. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're really into the Fifth Age. It was good, 
but it wasn't as good as Clandestine Circle, and it just makes both the Legion of Steel seem wildly ineffective, the Knights of Slamnia completely imbecilic, um, the, the bodyguards and the militia and the centaur military units completely feckless. I mean, it just makes everyone look like assholes except for the tarmac. And I guess militarily, I don't know, you could argue maybe, but why do we keep pounding this trope of the Slamnic Knights being hypocritical douchebags? Like, you don't have to do that. We're in an era where they're not supposed to be that way. It's an easy way to, like, turn what is supposed to be the shining example of honor and righteousness into a joke. But why? To what benefit is it? I just, I can't understand it. Do you guys get it? Like, it drives me nuts. All right, so let's see what you guys have to say here about this. Um, oh, just good enough. Good to see you. Uh, it's all good. Freaking vampires. What is that? You almost never get to see one live. Thanks for joining, Mr. Mundane. Good to see you. Let's see. Um, it was obviously the work. No good teenage box. <laughs> Old customs die hard. Uh, did the Slamic Knights know about Lynch's heritage? If so, that's even more inane that they would jump to the conclusion. Yeah, they all know she's a Majir. They know her father is Palin, served in the Chaos War, saved the world as far as everyone is concerned. Her grandfather is a hero of the lands caraman and tika majir so what the heck <laughs> i don't get it hey michael thanks for tuning in live um brian how you doing thanks for tuning in he's biased against her because of the previous activities and sanction despite being forgiven for it and reinstated he's very rigid this is the first novel in the trilogy though yeah you're right um one yes it's the first novel two she was cleared of all that so this is what I don't understand and, and why I have such a hard time wrapping my head around it. She disobeyed orders that were um, put her uh, basically under, you know, in prisoner status. The charges were dropped. So you're no long, you know, she did the right thing. She was cleared of any wrongdoing. So why this continued bias? If you are seen as having done something wrong and your name is then cleared. Why do people still think that you're a piece of shit? You were cleared. It doesn't make any sense. I get the Knights of Slamnia are not a monolith as well. And each individual knight has their own personal biases against other people. And it clearly states that he doesn't like her because of her attitude and her behavior and how she's a little bit more unorthodox than the other knights around him. Okay. But you're going to murder her with zero evidence because of that? I get you don't like her. I get that you would like to see her fail. But he straight up is trying to murder her for no reason. That's wildly outside of the oath and the measure. Like next level type shit. So I don't know. Um, it's cool that the Brutes are in this one. They're a cool race that was very mysterious to you from the Chaos War. Yeah, they were, uh, they're pretty awesome. You hope your recommendation for the clandestine circle has added something to this. Yes, Brian, it absolutely did. Thank you so very much for that. I really loved that novel a lot. Um, it's amazing how much writing style plays into your enjoyment of a story. Some Dragonlance story ideas are great, but they're boring, such as Gene Rabe for you. Gene Rabe's first novel I thought was great. After that, just diminished returns. You know, she's, she's, um, meh. <laughs> How are the audiobooks? I thought this audiobook was garbage. I thought the uh, the the woman narrating it or reading it did a terrible job with the voices. Um, I her pronunciation was all over the place, not consistent in a lot of um, a lot of cases. And I don't. I just didn't really enjoy it. Um, the re I think the only reason why I got this on audiobook is because I had a credit and. I was researching the Tarmax, uh, Ithikarthan, uh, what is it called? Um, continent for one of the setting episodes. And so I got the third book in this trilogy because that speaks to that continent, uh, more than any other materials ever have. And so I wanted to sort of, you know, get it from the source. But now that I had that one and I had some more audible credits, I just decided to get the whole trilogy this way. And boy, was that a mistake. I think, 
There's something lost in listening to a book versus reading it. Not only, of course, seeing the words written and then interpreting their pronunciation yourself, but also just the focus on the events. I found my mind wandering a little bit and I had to backtrack on the audio track in order to go back and try to re, you know, memorize or, or re-remember what I just listened to. And then, of course, taking notes is a pain in the ass. Like, I have to pause it, try to spell out how the notes I think are supposed to be spelled out because I'm doing it phonetically, and then uh, trying to, like, remember exactly what it was and reversing and replaying it when normally when I take notes, I just look down at the book, take the note, and I'm done. So the whole process for me was horrible. And the thing is, is I, I read, I, I listen to audiobooks a lot. It's just that when I'm trying to do basically a book report, you know, a review on it, I much prefer reading it myself than having it read to me. Um, it's odd that they would continually portray them as inept and arrogant. Yeah, Albert Witch, thanks for doing live. Hope I said your name right. I, I agree. Like, it just doesn't make any logical sense to me at all. And yes, if you have one guy trying to break the law, why not have the other knights stand up to him? Like, I get there's order and hierarchy, but when I was in the military service, they told you that it is your duty to follow orders from your superiors unless that order is illegal. Then it is your duty to report them and not follow through with that order. Why wouldn't that be a thing in the measure? Why would it be, I don't care if it's illegal or not, I'm your superior, you do what I say. That doesn't make any sense in any universe. It, like, it's illegal. You, you're going to not give her a chance to defend herself? You're not even going to bring up charges with any evidence? Get out of here. Stupid. Art imitates life more often than the other way around. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to get into the politics. Um, sadly, you think an accusation of someone lasts far longer than acquittal is wrong? Right, right. I mean, in the real world, but this is a fantasy novel. Let, like, let's... Let's keep real world politics out of it if we can. Uh, you have to backtrack a lot with audiobooks as well, as great as they are allowing you to experience stories. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. You could be wrong though. He's stubborn and still considers it a mark against her and his mind, adding to some of their recent disagreements while serving together. Yeah, yeah. And I just, I didn't believe it is all. You know, it, it was, it was a step too far for me, Brian. Ultimately, I get that he doesn't like her. I can't accept that he's willing to murder her because he doesn't like her. You know, she's effective. She's efficient. She's a knight of Salamnia. She's a knight of the rose. All of this should weigh on her benefit for murder without evidence. Like, I don't know. So your mind wanders when listening to audiobooks too? Yeah. I said duty. <laughs> At least Sir Hugh supports her, even if he could have done more. Yeah, I agree. And he did break her out. So not every Knight of Salamity is an asshat. Not everyone. <laughs> Just the vast majority of them. Which drives me crazy because I love Salamity Knights. Even in War of the Lands era. I always saw them as the greatest order of the entire Dragonlance universe. Like, I, I love Knights of Salamnia. It could be because of Storm Brightblade. It could be because of Gunther Uth Wistan. But for whatever reason, I always connected with that order of knights, and they're just always idiots. <laughs> Stop being stupid. It's a choice, authors. Damn. Uh, you're right, Jason. I mean, it is a, a, a real philosophical problem, but it, I don't know, you, you can't really talk about it without it becoming political. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can't even, I don't even know how to approach it without it getting there. Um, yeah, no, I feel you, Brian. Man, I do. Did Lyncha feel like a Majir? Yeah, she does. Lyncha's great. Lyncha is 100% badass. I really, really love her character. I didn't know anything about her. Mary Herbert does a great job of fleshing her character out. And to the author's credit, she does a great job of fleshing out all of the characters, even the ones I abjectly hate. And you have to appreciate that because that was her intention. So she's successful at getting you to hate people that she wants you to hate. What I really, really liked was that as inefficient and dysfunctional as the different knights of either the Legion of Steel or the Knights of Salamnia are, 
with each other and internally to see Thunder using mercenaries and the tarmac as agents on his behalf and then they go against him because they are just waiting just like minotaurs did into sylvanesty claiming land for themselves the tarmac want to do the exact same thing i imagine a world where the tarmac have all moved from ith and at least you know massive force of them planted themselves down in the plains of dust and they war with the minotaurs now there is no greater matchup then the Tarmac Brutes, the Minotaur. Those are two different cultures that are pure war. The Tarmacs do not have honor. The Minotaurs have a version of honor. I would love to see a book with those two clashing. And if it exists and I'm unaware of it, please let me know because I would love to read it. That would just be dope. I would love to see that. Um, you wanted to grow a big mustache? like I mean, I could shave it and just do that. Because it was, I'm, I'm with you. I, I imagine that as a young man reading this too. I was just like, oh, one day I'll grow a mustache like that. <laughs> and then like years later, I saw like American Chopper and the Paul Sr. had like a big old long mustache. It wasn't long. It just, you know, shaved to his chin. Um, I was like, oh, that's awesome. I, I'm going to do that one day. And then when I was able to grow facial hair, I was like, I don't want to look like an asshole. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. It's just not my style, man. Not anymore anyway. Um, let's see. Thank goodness for Gunther, a great example of night besides Sturm. Yeah. I, and, and also, it, it just... You're forced by comparison to truly appreciate Gunther Uth Wistan. Like, you have to. Like, you, there's no other option. Because compared to every other night, he is literally the shining pinnacle <laughs> of everyone he defended Sturm when no one else would um he gave the uh con command of the Islamic forces to a colonisty princess i mean he he rewrote the measure because he saw how terrible it ended up being like he's great he's the best of us the best of them <laughs> Let's see, surprisingly, they killed Thunder in the first novel. Yeah, so with few dragon overlords, they need to keep some alive story-wise. Well, the thing is, Thunder isn't really, and Aesta, they're not really dragon overlords. They're lesser overlords. And so they're meant to be fodder for storytelling. Like, that's, that's the whole point with them, you know? They didn't want to destroy any massive overlords unless it was a huge story arc. And so that's what they did with the War of Souls. And with some of the later modules at the end of the, the life cycle of Dragonlance in 3.5 with uh, Sovereign Press, Margaret Weiss Productions, that's when you really wrap up all the Overlord's storylines. But ultimately, uh, yeah, they wanted to make sure that there were some dragons in hiding like, um, oh, what's his name? I forgot his name, Crucible. And then there was uh, some lesser dragon overlords that could then be taken out and stuff just for storytelling purposes. Uh, let's see. You guessed that there was the Huma books with Kaz, but yeah, it would be interesting to get really, really into it. Uh, hey, Ruba Yat, sorry I messed up your name. Thanks for joining live. Yeah, I mean, the Tarmac weren't even a thing until Summer of Chaos, until Dragons of Summer Flames. So, you know, like it wouldn't have existed back in the day with uh, Huma and, and uh, Kaz. But it would be nice because there is like an offshoot of Kaz's version of, of Minotaurs, right? The Kazalati. It'd be nice to see them. And I don't know why they haven't interacted. They're really the closest species to each other. Their islands are closer than anywhere else. They're both seafaring people. They're both warrior people. I don't know why they haven't met in any novels yet. It seems like the perfect like bad guy v. bad guy ultimate warrior showdown you know and narratively it makes sense if they're right next to each other in southern ancelon like they you know if you're going to expand like the minotaurs want to do through their god sergonis taking over all of ancelon then they naturally are going to butt up against the tarmac love to see it and gunther didn't uh throw taz in jail right away when he first meets him yeah, yeah. <laughs> that could be seen as a, a lack of judgment actually <laughs> i just finished reading dragonlance saga book five 
part three. I broke it up into three parts for the sake of the Dragonlance reading series, which all deals with the High Claris Tower and that inciting incident with Sturm and Kidiara and stuff. Weeping. I was openly weeping the entire second half of reading it. It's the worst. And then I had to edit it. And I was weeping editing it too after I had blown my nose and cleared my eyes up and everything. It, it's so sad. Like you read it in the book and it's not a very long section. And so you know, you're, you're affected. Maybe you shed a tear and you move on. In the comic, they spend tons of time on it and it's all visual. And so <laughs> it's just the worst. I had no idea it would affect me like that. Still, still, you, like... 27, 30 years later after I read it the first time? That's bananas. Ugh. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. That's all I had today. Uh, that is it for my review of Citadel of the Lost by Mary H. Herbert. Did you enjoy the setting of Galdracalas? And did it remind you of what we do in the shadows as well? Do you wish that they would have explained more about Thunder and his relationship with the tarmac? You can always email me at info at dlsaga.com or leave a comment below. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell to get notified about upcoming videos, and click the like button. This all goes to help other Dragonlance fans learn about this channel and its content. And of course, this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga. Thank you so much for joining in the celebration. Thank you for watching. This has been Adam with Dragonlance Saga. Until next time, Slanjavar.